Yeah, I think um, we'll 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 um, we'll make a start. So good evening, everyone, um, and thank you very much for joining us for this evening's ISTD live event. Nice to have you with us, and it's a great pleasure to introduce Matt Lamont, um, who has, runs Out of Place Studio in um, Bradford. But just a few words. I'm Sally Hope about ISTD. Um, this talk is a part of a series of uh, live events from ISTD. Please keep an eye on social media for future events. And on the events page, you can um, see previous events that we've archived and you can watch if you've missed them or want to go back and have another listen. Before I introduce Matt, a few details about ISTD. We're a professional body run by typographers, for typographers, graphic designers, educators and design students. We have an international membership, a aim to create and inspire an interest in all forms of typo in typographic practice. You can find out more about ISTD on the ISTD website. Um, also a big thank you to the team behind this event for all their hard work and support. It's quite a sort of, um, lots of people get lots of um, involved. So thank you very much for everyone behind that, behind the scenes there. So this evening, it's a real pleasure to introduce Matt Lamont, designer, educator, collector, and archivist. Matt's design work is prim primarily, primarily in arts and culture and based up in the lovely Bradford and he's director of Out of Place Studio. Matt will talk about his um, passion for collecting and all things design. And after his talk, there'll be an opportunity for people to ask questions. So if you can pop them in the chat, that'd be great. So thanks, Matt, and welcome to this. And thank you, and welcome to this evening's event. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen. I've got a uh, one second. Am I right? Just to be pause for a second, just to share this. There we go. Um, I'll just pop this on full screen. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, I always get really nervous when when people start <laughs> sort of mentioning my name. I, I was still getting posture syndrome even today. I don't think that'll ever go away, to be fair. Um, but um, Tony, who's uh, I noticed has joined us, said it's it's good to be modest. So I'm uh, yeah, I guess I'm modest <laughs> about it. Um, so yeah, the three themes of my presentation: uh, collecting, curating. And creating. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why I collect, the things I collect, what I do with the collection, um, and also a bit about sort of the joys of design and creating. Um, so yeah, my name is Matt Lamont. Um, I graduated in 2011, so I've worked in the design industry since then. Um, I am a big archivist. Um, I like I spend a lot of time scanning design on lunch breaks in between jobs. Um, I don't always swing this title around, but arguably a design historian um, due to the sort of classes that I teach on a freelance basis and the activities I'm involved with um, outside of my day to day as well. Well, this is inspired by the uh, famous new new graphic magazine uh, if anyone recognizes it i've just invented the colors um so a little bit about my inspirations so a lot of this presentation is more about the things i love and why i collect rather than my own work because people can just check out portfolios and websites and things like that so one of my design heroes um i thought i'd just mention him because he, he is probably one of my two inspirations, um, my, well, my biggest inspirations is Ken Garland, uh, not only due to his design, but due to his ethics, his whole career, his involvement with CND. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show a slide of collected items designed by Ken Garland. Um, I'm also really interested in mid-century design, um, particular design inspired by the Swiss international typographic movement. And I'm also at the minute um, collecting and doing a lot around Japanese mid-century design. So a lot of things I've been collecting are sort of based on 1950s and 1960s design produced in Japan. 
So as I said, um, I'm going to talk a lot about collecting, curating and creating. Um, this is me um, with my hair a bit windswept behind some of the archives. So currently there's these four by four Ikea bookcases. There's probably about 11 or 12 of those worth of items currently and a few boxes and things like that. Um, so yeah, I've been collecting for probably, probably about 14 years now. Uh, and the things I've collected have varied um, from sort of books about logos to, to Stadley catalogs, some nice Sandberg work, um, a few posters here and there, matchbox labels. Um, and I've probably accumulated about 5,000 items and about 4,000 pieces of ephemera, which includes stamps and matchbox labels and exhibition brochures and catalogs. Um, and just to reiterate the theme once again, so it's about collecting, curating and creating. Um, so I just created these just inspired by um, the Work magazine a few slides back. Matt, can I, I, my screen's, I don't know if it's anyone else, my screen's not moving. I'm still on the first slide. I don't know if anyone. Oh, so is mine, so is mine. Uh, yeah, one second then, I will change that. Um, I think it's because I went full screen. Um, let's just get off that and we'll just show that again. Yeah, um, just bear with me one second. Thanks, Matt. Is that better? Is that, is that, that better? Yes. Oh, great. So I'll just slide through them really quick again. Um, Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, I was inspired a lot by Ken Garland, uh, one of my heroes. Um, collect a lot of mid century design and Japanese design. Sorry about that. I think when it goes to full screen, it must have cut it off. Um, and here's yeah the themes of the talk: collecting, curating, and creating, um, and some nice pictures of some happy students using the archive and me utilising it in in creation. Um, so, um, so I've always been inspired by visual culture. I've always um, I did a bit of writing recently for Idea Magazine, and I was thinking about have I always collected things, and I collected. Pogs, I've collected football stickers, never liked football. For I collected World Cup 98 football stickers. Um, I've always collected something. Um, and I guess it's like a, a healthy obsession. Um, but it but it's um yeah, visual culture, I guess, has always been something that I've just been obsessed with. Um, and, in, and in all its aspects, so this is just a passage from Idea Magazine. Um, so I've always been really just passionate about anything visual. Um, and it doesn't matter how small it is, from a stamp to a billboard, to massive lettering on building, or to small, intricate, sort of hand-drawn type on, um, on, on labels. Um, I've seen, recently started collecting little, little drinks labels from the 20s and 30s and little fruit labels, which I can sort of hold up shortly. I've got some in here. Um, and what I love about design is just the impact it can have and how by changing just a colour or just a typeface, it can have a completely different meaning. How design can give a positive impact to a negative connotations. It can denote the beauty of things. It can give us organisation and structure and wayfinding or typographic layout. It can give a sense of calmness around us. It can put us at ease. It can cause destruction and wars, and it can just spread propaganda. Um, so for me, I basically based a bulk of this presentation on my favourite typographic items. Um, and I love it how, you know, supermarkets, they're the modern design museum of the day. You can walk through a supermarket and say, this is, this is current design for the capitalist masses, or I can go in a museum and see sort of the history of design. And I love the difference between going to the supermarket and the museum, and this collection of objects can tell stories. 
And I've, I've stole this quote from a design history presentation I was watching in America. And I, but it, it really spoke to me. Um, and it's just learn from the mistake of others. You can't live long enough to make them all yourself. And that is a quote that has resonated with me since I heard, heard that. Uh, and it's sort of a reason why I collect, because I can look at things that have been designed. I can look at the purpose. I can look at the output. I can look at the challenges that designers will face in and the output they relate to a brief. I kind of use it as a starting point in my own practice. So collecting. I've, yeah, I've been collecting a long time. I've been collecting recently little pieces of Japanese ephemera from the 1920s to 1950s. So I recently got about 140 pieces of ephemera in job lots. Um, and I, um, I can't translate these currently, but I just really love the illustrations on there. Um, I've been collecting stamps, these 1982 Bulgarian stamps. Um, anyone who follows me on social media, I did a post yesterday about, about this designer. Um, and even down to things like your everyday design. Um, so these beer mats are from the 1960s. Um, and what I do a lot of time is I'll start a design brief and I'll just try and look through the archive at something that just gives me a bit of inspiration, a bit just that little bit of creative impulse that I need rather than say looking on Pinterest or Behance and things like that. And these are some really nice Victorian music sheets. I recently picked them, picked up. Um, I showed these to a few people at a Birmingham Design Festival. Um, so I was just showing things I collect to a few people on my phone. I met a few colleagues there. Um, and I just love these intricate typographic layouts and the use of typefaces. Um, and it's quite a contrast to the other things that I'm interested in. And I find that my interests just kind of change month by month, depending on what I'm working on or something I've looked at. And that's kind of influenced the things that I collect in the archive. And that middle one is just beautiful. <laughs> it's just that, that soft, well, it's quite a harsh gradient, really. And those intricate little flourishes and things like that. It's just, that to me, that is, that is the height of design, is there. Um, and recently as well, I've been collecting things like fruit labels and um, I've got these in front of me, so I've just scanned them in recently. Um, they're, they're quite big. Um, they're just these really nice American, sort of really bold type on shadow type on there. Um, so I've always, I guess, been interested in history. I grew up and I thought I was an archaeologist. I've always been interested in things like space and sort of unknown territories and geography. But it wasn't until graduating that I really became interested in the history of graphic design. When I was studying, I was interested in things like collage or new media. Um, I did a BTEC on learning multimedia design, things like CD-ROM design and things like that. I would soon become obsolete, but it was after graduating and getting a job in the industry that I realised I've got this real passion for history, um, especially mid-century. Uh, I wanted to kind of use that in my own work, but have something there as a backbone to kind of base a foundation on the way I work. So yeah, currently I've got probably over 5,000 objects in the archive on these shelves. And these are just housed in a co-working space where my practice is based. Um, so luckily they, they let me use a bit of floor space upstairs. Um, and here's a few objects I wanted to include in the presentation that have a typographic theme which I've collected over the last 10 years. So this is a really nice Victorian American magazine called Fun from 1869. And I, I bought this um, basically for a presentation I was doing to the Barcelona School of Design uh, and I wanted to gather real objects for the presentation. Um, so whenever I am doing design lectures, I try to have the content in front of me. So whether that's online or in person, I have a physical object I can show, I can hold up, or it's got a tactile approach to it. Um, and you, you, you get some really nice, so not just typographic layouts, but nice flourishes of illustration. And you also get some things like, I don't know what the Ox, Oxford and Cambridge Toilet Club is. <laughs> but you do find some quite funny things amongst these. Um, here's, here's a magazine from 1888, uh, the Magazine of Art. Uh, an Art Deco and Art Nouveau based um, magazine. 
And, and the, as well as having this beautiful DNA ligature and this really nice R um, with these really nice floral features on the front, the advertising inside is just as beautiful. Um, and then um, another piece from the archive, what's um, been, been really inspiring just at the way you can sort of change your mass head and still have the same look and feel is the Jugend magazine, which was an Art Nouveau youth magazine um, published in Germany. So I don't know the designer on the on the one on the left, which is the earliest issue I have. But I really like how they've changed that mass head, um, but kept similar features to sort of bring it together as one series. And this green is really nice as well, considering how old it is. And these are some, I've, I've been collecting quite a lot of um, typographic magazines, um, anything ranging from sort of 1910s to about 1980. Um, and here's some from the collection that um, um, was published in Germany. Um, and this Ludislav Sutner National Theatre posters I picked up quite a while ago. Um, they're very thin. They're very thin. You can even, when you scan them, you see the other side of the paper coming through. And these have been quite inspirational in the way that they've laid out information and the way that they've laid out table with sort of minimal de devices um, using the technology available. Um, we've got really nice sort of reverse air on ink um, and nice tables and things like that. Now, recently, I was unaware of this Czech journal called Typographia, and I was doing a bit of research online looking for Typographica magazine, um, and I was just trying various translations to try to find, a, find some issues on other websites. And I came across this really nice Czech magazine, and I ended up finding about 100 issues, and each of the covers, they just, they've got this playful, poetic take on typography. Here's another one. Um, and this is sense of motion within the type as well. And I reduce type as image and kind of use that shape to kind of depict a symmetry. Um, they had an issue devoted to Japanese design here. And the back covers are just as beautiful as the front covers. A lot of the back covers are advertising typefaces. There's a few monotype back covers. Um, and they kind of like denote the, the front of the magazine as well. I just love this this overlap here. I think I've always been a big fan of overlays, especially since collecting mid-century design. So when I see something like this, I instantly want to scan it. Um, and here, here is a very interesting piece I picked up from uh, the 1940s from Leicester Museum and Art Gallery, which recently they went for a rebrand and changed. They changed. I think it was just called Leicester Art Gallery, and they changed back to Leicester. Museum and Art Gallery, um, and I sort of shared this scan with them, and they was very happy because I could include it in board meetings on how they've gone back to traditions. And um, I get, I really love the the red, the red on black. So this falls into three. Um, the other side is sort of not as engaging as the front. And I picked this piece. I bought this piece off Mark Hall a few years ago, and I love the cascading type and the motion. And um, there's always been quite a centre for great mid-century designs in Kassel in Germany. And um, yeah, this is just for, it's a culture calendar. Uh, I've got a lot of theatre posters as well um, from the same era by Carl, As Car um, Carl Oscar Blairs, who's one of my favourite designers. Um, if anyone hasn't seen any of Carl Oscar Blairs' work, check that out, it's, it's amazing. Um, this catalogue, I just think anyone who's aware of Bridget Riley's work will instantly have a connection where the type has a connection to Bridget Riley's work. And so this is probably a custom typeface. It looks a quite quite like a typeface that I've used recently called Fixture. Um, and it just it just really denotes Bridget Riley's work. Um, and if anyone's unaware of a design group called Scion. Um, there's this really nice, this is kind of an exhibition catalogue, and it's got this really nice concrete poetry. And on every page, you sort of got these really intricate typesetting. And the cover's really nice. It's got really nice overlaps. Um, that's great. And this is a piece by Wolf Zimmerman, which 
he did um, some fantastic posters, actually, for the Jazz Festival as well in the 1960s. Unfortunately, I've not been able to collect the posters due to storage spaces here, um, but the catalogues are just as beautiful and intricate. And the back cover's kind of like, it's it's got a similar sort of motion with, with the jazz typography as well. Here's a piece um, by William Pleen, um, famous photographer. Um, and, and designer for Domas, um, so like an interior and architecture magazine. And I really like the torn motion of this. And I've always been a fan of collage. And I, I sort of, I think it was during the lockdown, I watched a live um, talk. I think it was through the Letterform archive, um, if I remember rightly. And there was like a collage masterclass. And I had, through job lots of collecting magazines and books, I had some stacks of just random ephemera magazines and I really got into collage and I find it as a way of relaxing and escaping my day-to-day uh, -day design and um, so seeing something like this is yeah I, I find it a big inspiration for my personal work rather than the work I do in the agency um, and there's a there's a lot I've seen um, Japanese 1960s that uses sort of design system uh, and hierarchy uh, in, in the design. Uh, this magazine title design, which is one of probably, it was one of Japan's longest standing design magazines. Um, I think it, it ran, it was from the late 1950s um, it started and the magazine itself commissioned some of the leading Japanese designers as as a, for the covers, including Aiko Tanaka, Kamikura. Um, and um, this piece has always been very popular when I've shared it online. It was an Italian magazine. Um, it, they had covers by Max Huber, um, this one by Bob Norder. And um, yeah, it, I couldn't um, sh just show all that typography work without mentioning Armin Hoffman. Um, so I've been collecting his work, his catalog designs for numerous years. I've probably got about 12 of them now. Um, and I've tried to kind of emulate his grids in my own work by tracing them in, um, tracing paper and then putting the grids into InDesign using them in my own work. And I find that quite a great resource when I collect things like this is trying to lay them out and then give them like a new digital Sophia in my own work. So rather than having objects that sit on shelves and get dusty or they're never used, I think to just grab them and use them and, and be inspired in, in my own work. So, um, and this Herb Lublin, which has got probably two of my favorite logos on, which is, if I can find it now, the mother and child logo, which, um, let's see if we can zoom in on there, which uh, arguably is one of the best logos ever made the mother and child logo there. I just think that's I just think it's phenomenal. Um I could I could look at that all day. Um and the sound of music logo, which is really nice. The I've got the catalogue for that, but the inners are not, not as great as the typographic masterpiece on the front. Um, I've recently uh, been commissioned to write an article on Wim Crowell's work for the Stadley Museum for Idea Magazine. And it gave me a chance to get out all the catalogues, kind of reminisce over, over the, the work that I collected when I was over in Amsterdam with David Quay. And these, these three, arguably, probably my favourite catalogues, especially Jackson Pollock, which has that sort of random kind of ap appeal to it, which denotes the work of Jackson Pollock. And as much as he set the catalogues out, did Crowell in Universe, he kind of he created custom typefaces for the covers and he, and he used the artwork and the themes of the exhibition to really be the basis of how the type would look on the covers. Um, Foundry Types recreated the typeface on the middle catalogue there recently. Um, and it's a great typeface. It was used at a Dutch Design Week. I've been eyeing it up since. I'm one day going to use it for a project. Um, Foundry Types do a, do a great job in sort of bringing um, a lot of the work from Crowell or a lot of Crowell-inspired work 
to uh, digital sphere um, so they're definitely worth checking out anyone who wants to use any crowd related typefaces um, Yves Zimmerman uh, did this amazing cover uh, from Typographisch Manusplatter. Um, I've been trying to get all these magazines, but they, they're quite hard to come by these days. Um, so I got issue one and two, which have the same typographic layout. And it it very much reflects the work going on in, in Switzerland at the time. So it, it's, it's very ML Ruder based. Um, and I think he was a member of ISTD, if I remember rightly, uh, the work of Carl Swan. Um, I wrote a small essay on Carl Swan's work for Jazz Journal, and he contacted me from Australia, and we, we had a great dialogue. So I published the, the article, and then he was telling me how he did a lot of these covers for free tickets and records for his, for his favourite jazz musicians. Um, I, and um, I yeah, I think I've got about 50 um, designs that I did now, and this hair's one uh, is definitely one that's my favourite. And I used to play a lot with wooden letterpress. I used to buy Indian drawing ink and get wooden letters, and I'd just kind of put them on my desk and I'd paint them in and I'd scatter them around in random places and kind of create my own layouts. Um, I should do a lot more of that recently. I've kind of not done as much traditional work, but I definitely need to... Get back onto that um, i'm sure a lot of people can relate to me sometimes you just kind of need to go back to that hand-drawn craft and then find inspiration again to bring back in the digital sphere um i think there's a book being published soon but i may be wrong on christian Krusen, and he did a lot of work for wolfgang verlag's and um, poetry books um i can't remember how many he did now i think there's over 30 of these um maybe 40, um, I've collected around 20 of them. And they've just got this real playful play on, on type. Um, so the front and back covers, they use the same, not all of them, but a lot of them use the same content and the same type as the front cover, but have a little play on the layout there, a few rotations, a few overlaps, I've got a few cuts on. And this this one's great. Um, this, this piece by L.A. Lost in Cohen which just basically is what it says on the tin. It's about kinetic sculptures, but sort of brings that motion and that kineticness to them. Um, there's a really nice um, kinetic art catalogue. I can't remember who it's, who it's by that I collected. I um, can't remember if it, it wasn't Bob Gill. Um, I'll, I'll show the talk, I'll, I'll hold it up. Um, and a graphics magazine has been something I've been collecting for a while. So I've been trying to get issue one to 200, about five issues off now. And this has been a good inspiration for historical context. And I mean, the editors were tired, tired, uh, on, on this magazine, um, sometimes even making a loss. And what I've really found interesting about magazines is how at the time when they was published, there was bringing design to to a worldwide audience which was often undocumented or it was new and it's it's such an inspiration that this could be picked up and you could view everything from around, all the best design from around the world and you had it in the palm of your hands um well before the internet and other forms of new media for sharing design so magazines has been the main thing i have been collecting over the last few years and to me, just having that chronological order of almost design tombs and tomes of information at my hands, um, it's, it's great for writing. And it's also great because every one of these, it represents a time, it represents a place, even, even a set month of design. It's really nice cascading time. This was uh, a Dutch avant-garde journal, uh, about, mainly about Flemish poetry. And every every issue in this year uh, used the same mass head um, there with a guard civic um, and the, the contents are on the front of each one. Um, so I'm not sure who the designer is on this one. Um, I know the, I think the commission Benno was in for a different cover. Um, and Facts magazine, I, I love just how it's just simple typographic. So we're limited budget. Herb Lublin was able to produce covers that was really striking. Uh, I mean, this on a newsstand in the 1960s, 
I mean, it just stand out amongst sort of the way that photography were utilised. And even though it was done on a budget, arguably, it has probably got such a bigger impact than any other magazines produced in that era. Um, Fat Magazine just kind of brought um, kind of issues and problems in society to the masses, which were often undocumented. And a lot of counterculture magazines that were shut down and you know, the people was arrested. Uh, I know Ralph Ginsberg, who was the editor for this, got in all sorts of trouble. But it's great that design can be a platform and print can be a platform to bring these issues of society to the masses. Um, ju just now, our social media can, you know, we can share news that is often un undocumented to people and share things that are going on which, which need public attention. And I, and I know I'm really sad, but I do have a uh, one of Hublin's Caslon um, ampersands tattooed on my arm that I got when I was 19. <laughs> um, Wolfgang Schmidt, uh, another great designer um, from Germany, he did a lot with the public film publishing house, Atlas. And I came across a lot of work from Atlas when a book was published by James Muller um, about sort of film graphics and it had a lot of work by Hans Hillman in, Wolfgang Schmidt, Carl Oscar Blaze. And since getting that book, I just had to collect some, some work by all three of those. So reasons, I know I might have dragged on that little bit with <laughs> things from the archive, but I just wanted to share some of my sort of favorite pieces there. So a lot of people say, why, why do I do this? Why, why is it such a passion? And there's a lot of reasons really, but my main, my main reason is I want to create almost like a place, whether that's physical, whether that's digital, where all this design is documented. And there's been some great people who have, who have done that. Um, the Letterform Archive, the People's History Archive, um, Rich down at Logo Archive is doing a great job in documented mid-century brands and logos. And I, I kind of more want to create a sort of physical access archive. And I guess my passion kind of sometimes overtakes me um, and it's it's never gone away really. So I kind of hide behind the archive sometimes. It's sometimes a bit of an anxiety shield, so to speak. Um, but what I really want to do as well is make sure that design education is still taught and it's still accessible to people learning design. So on the back of that really own mission, uh, I've done various talks recently. Um, one with Sally uh, Bournemouth, I've done some at Leeds Beckett, I've done some with Mark Bloom at Vassal in the School of Design, some in Milan. And I've, I've really just wanted to make sure people understand the history because without understanding the history, we're just going to design something that's on trend now and it's got no historical standpoint. I've just saw your question there, Tony. Um, so why is it important to study graphic design history? Um, are there problems not being aware of design? Um, I think there is. I mean, if you was, say, designing some soap and you wanted, uh, you know, you wanted it to look classy, you wanted it to look historic, you're going to look to look at some Victorian design. You want your design to have a focal point or a meaning. Or you could design things in the wrong colour. You could design a type. You could design something um, to to them to uh, an audience in another country where the colour can mean something completely different. Um, I saw probably a few years ago uh, an advertising campaign done. I don't know if it was Coca Cola or another drink, and it was done as a storyboard of a free two or three billboards. And the, and the designer, um, I'm not sure even if it was just something someone made up, really, um, but it was like someone almost passing out in a in a desert. Um, and then the next billboard was someone having a Coca-Cola or whatever energy drink it was, and then it was all better at revived. But the way that the people read information, um, especially in, in Middle Eastern countries, is the opposite way around. So the advertising campaign was almost like, oh, I've had a Coca-Cola <laughs> and then and then I'm passing out in the desert. Um, so I've been just, just an understanding on, on, on culture and the way people perceive ideas and information is definitely important. 
Um, and Elizabeth's just put a question there. How can you afford to buy so many archival materials? Um, well, I'm a Yorkshire man, so I love a bargain. Um, so I always manage to find stuff at a really good price. I never pay ridiculous prices. I think I did for Wincrow's um, monograph a while ago. Uh, I think I paid <laughs> 250 euros for that one. But a lot of stuff I just find um, for really cheap on eBay or from other sellers. I guess because I don't collect something in particular, I'm never looking at something which has a high price point. I'm always looking for content, content and context. So I managed to find stuff for 99p or a few euros. And it's more about the appearance of them and their historical significance on why I collect them. And you find a lot of time when you, for anyone who does collect design, is don't search for the designer. If you search for the designer, it's going to have a high price point, search for the organization or search for the year, and you'll find something a fraction of the price. I guess the problem with the internet is anyone can find out how much things are worth. But I tend to buy job lots as well. So I'll buy a job lot and say if I, I recently got a job lot of design annuals and I think it was about 60 pounds on auction. Uh, I won them for, it was about 14. I needed three of them um, or five of them or something like that. So the rest would go for sale and then I'd get the money back for what I paid. So now I've got um, a substantial collection. I can buy job lots and if I share the other items and never make a profit on them, really. I just reinvest the profits back into the archive. I used to be really bad with it. I used to spend about £300 a month <laughs> on the archive, but it's it's brought me to where I am today. And a lot of what I do is kind of really expanding my knowledge so I can share that with both an online and in-person community. And I believe by sharing that knowledge, can inspire other people and I can use that to build the archive more and I kind of see it as a never-ending thing now. I've gone too far. It's going to be ongoing forever now, is the archive and collecting. Um, I've just seen another question about picking up on Ken Garland. Um, yeah, so uh, for anyone who can't see it yet, Tony's just said, picking up on Ken Garland and design ethics, um, design from 1945 to 80, seemed to be about design for the public sector. Since the 1980s, it seemed to be about designers as egos. Um, someone else mentioned this to me recently, um, and why I don't collect design from 1980s onwards. Um, and I, I guess... I've always, I've always just been inspired by my, something with, not, I'm not saying that design in the 1980s had no depth, it sure had depth, but design, I guess design kind of become a lot of a face rather than sort of its significance. Um, so there's a lot of designers um, in the 1960s who designed because they wanted social teams to change. Um, you know, there was a lot in America um, with the feminist movement. Um, it was, it was it at Yale, I think I remember, and really getting people to design uh, because they wanted change, they wanted to, to have a voice. Um, and if, I guess with the rise of social media and things like that, there's a lot of shouting to try and get design work, and there's a lot kind of less being told and lots less being taught about the ethics of a designer. There's been several books being published over probably since I sort of studied in sort of early 2000s, mid 2000s about ethics in design. And then and Stephen Heller did a book about the citizen designer. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said about people having sort of strong ethics in design. There's things now, a lot of people are going for B Corp status, which we're in the process here, which is a lot about not just the work you do, but the supply chain and even stuff like your policies and things like that. And I feel design where possible should be used for social good because as a designer, we have almost too much power for public opinion. We can inform people about the right and wrong decisions. We can kind of give people way finding what needs to communicate to audiences of all sort of neurological abilities. And we do have kind of a lot of power in society with design. So, I mean, I mean, for me, a lot of what we do is, is 
third sector. Um, and it comes back to my passion for design for good. And when I have been writing about designers like Ken Garland's, um, David King, uh, another great designer from the 60s, they people have really resonated for me, not just the design output, but more the ethics and the reasoning behind the design. So we're curating a design archive, so to speak. And I, I say it's a design archive just because I catalog it and it, it, it's used basically uh, and it's on shelves. It's brought a lot of opportunities and connections. So where I've always kind of shied away, and, and a lot of people will probably do this like me, they kind of shy away from being the face of their design work. And I've kind of used my archive almost as a to uplift um, my own sort of kind of shyness and anxiety, really. But it's brought a lot of opportunities and connections, both in teaching, uh, both in just meeting people, um, having shared passions and knowledge. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been doing writing sort of independently outside of work for Idea Magazine about collecting the, the reasons why I collect. So we do um, every quarter an article, uh, which is based around the archive and, and my passions. Uh, I write it in English and we translate it in Japanese and we have it um, sort of a bilingual. Uh, so the first one. Um, which they refer to me as design eccentric, um, which I couldn't argue <laughs> really, was just an overview about, about um, the archive, reasons why I collect and my passion for periodicals. Um, and the recent one on Ken Garland and his work for Design Magazine and some of the designers he commissioned, uh, like Henry on another hero, hands down. Um, I mean, the unit editions book on Henry and Ken Garland, uh, arguably some of the best design monographs ever published. Um, I, I, mean, I, I just love the railway one by Ken Garland there, just the use of type and motion to depict the railway in the railway lines. It's one of the better covers. And um, I was really um, overjoyed, so to speak, that my hero, Stephen Heller, interviewed me for Print Magazine. And he's always been like my, I guess it was like, I don't know, people might have the heroes growing up who were like film stars or um, I don't know, footballers or something like that. But Stephen Heller is my 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 actor, my um, my hero. So um, when, it, when he asked, to interview me, I, I was I was overjoyed. I couldn't say <laughs> I'd have never said no. Um, I kind of look at in the footsteps of him and hope that would be me one, one day. <laughs> um, and I've done uh, interviews with Unit Editions, and I, I noticed recently when I was searching for my website, Time Room did a little feature on me, which was a nice surprise. And it's great that this passion for collecting and this real fuel of energy I've got for design, you know, it's uh, it's recognised. I never thought it would be recognised. I never really wanted it to be recognised. It was just my little passion of and what I do in, in Bradford. So, uh, yeah, I felt overjoyed to share them passions with people. And through collecting, it's given me a lot of opportunities in education. So I've started an MA years ago in Sheffield. Always regret never finishing it, but maybe, I guess one day, um, maybe when my little lad's a, a little bit older and is at school, I'll do a PhD or MA in, in sort of design studies um, with the view of one day publishing books about design history. Um, but yeah, the archives, it's opened, it's kind of given me opportunities, um, I would say, to, to teach, but I... I guess instead of teaching, it's more sharing passion and knowledge. It's the way I teach is quite informal. I use the objects rather than myself to tell the story. Um, so this is we we do in the studio. Um, so so as I mentioned at the start, the the archive is housed above me in a big uh, co-working open event space here in Bradford, a place called Assembly Bradford, and once a year. Um, sometimes twice a year. I work with Leeds Beckett students um, with first years, uh, sometimes third years as well. And we take them out of the classroom and we, we talk about design history for a full day. So I get 
tables everywhere. I just fill them with really great content. And I get the student interacting with design history to be inspired by something that's more tactile and physical. And then on the offshoot of that, the students then have to present to me at the university on what they think I should collect and what should be in the archive that I haven't find, found on my online archive or from having a day in the archive. And it's really great that the archive can start the contextual studies and start students with sort of critical thinking techniques um, and really just having that sort of view on design history and being able to pick a book up and say, oh, that looks like this, this reminds me of this and kind of create those relations and connections themselves. I also recently did a class uh, with Barcelona School of Design where I got them to find a new piece of design whether that be on Behance or, or Create Boom or another great design blog online. And I got them to find something and compare it to a piece of design history, what it relates to. So some people got sort of some posters or record sleeves and sort of compared them with some Russian avant-garde design and they picked up the connections on how that design would be inspired or they wanted to communicate a mes message that would communicate from an era or a piece of design. And it, it really inspired me seeing the students' essays when I, when I marked them and the pieces of work that they found, and um, especially around the student who did the Willie Fleckhouse Twen magazine uh, and compared that with a new piece of design by Matt Wiley. And both of those designs to me are big inspirations, both old and new. Um, and seeing these together and re reading uh, these and marking them, it was it was just really nice that they kind of picked up stuff from my lecture and used that with, with new design. Um, this is this is a class that I did in, in Bournemouth. So we did um, a hundred, it was a hundred years of design told through a hundred objects in a digital presentation. And then those hundred objects I brought wheeled down on suitcases down in um, down down to Bournemouth and put those on tables. So it was after the digital presentation, they could then view those objects um, and kind of pick them up and kind of interact with them. Um, just quite blurry this photo. Um, but there's some really nice chocolate labels from the 1940s. There's some Sandberg there, there's some Japanese stuff, there's some great American Olympics design on there. Um, it's, it is a, a zoom in of some of that, that content there. Um, so I've got some really nice old bill heads there from, from the early 1900s. And what I didn't realize at the time is one of them actually was from Bournemouth and it was the street that one of the students was um, was was resided for accommodation there, which was quite nice. This one, this one on the far right here, um, I, I picked this up on eBay and it was from the same street as what my studio's on, um, which is quite nice for a blind, blind society and it was 1906. Um, and a lot, a lot of a lot of the work on these bill heads, these hand-drawn pieces of typographic engraving, um, I could never design something so intricate myself, but just to look at them and, and appreciate that level of craft is, is enough to inspire me. Um, it's really nice seeing things like, like sign making and letterpress kind of at a height again. I'm seeing a lot of people kind of setting up pra practices, setting up letterpress workshops, RISO printing workshops. And it's really nice to see this booming again. Um, I really need to sign myself up on some classes and, and have a play with that. Um, here's, here's some of the students from Leeds Beckett having fun with the archive. I also, I also get this moment of like, I hope nothing gets damaged, but then as long as it's being used and people are being inspired, then, you know, if a few staples come out and he's rebinding, I'm happy with that. Just to see everyone using it, smiling, I don't know, just, just being inspired by it, really. Um, that Them double bookshelves on the back, are, I mean, there's an all idea magazine on the top shelf and then there's graphics magazine there. So everything's in chronological order. Um, although I never... I never remember how long it takes to uh, put things back after continually getting things out for a day. So usually a day in annual leave is 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 used for that. Um, and I've also worked with design agencies on like inspirational afternoons or inspirational days and so get some pastries in and I kind of ask them what they're working on, what briefs 
um, they need inspiration from and find historical content and influence their design. So it's a day out for them. It's a, uh, a day away from the computer for me. And it's great just to see them using it really. Um, and then kind of trying to find their output on those projects and see what, the, what they've done and if they've used that inspiration as well. And it's amazing how much dialogue you get um, when different people interact with objects as well, because people can share their inspirations or they'll find something that they remember as a student or they know what they were sort of inspired for from a previous project at a previous practice. Um, and I'm always just wanting to document not just the photography, but the conversations. I wonder I have to get a video of uh, some of these and share them online of, of the sessions. I guess they're just inspiring for me as, as they are for the people who are visiting and sort of using the archive. Um, so a lot of the curating as well, I'm now doing on social media. So I, I created a kind of as a bit of a passion. I think I started in lockdown as a social media um, Facebook group called Graphic Design History, which self-titled that. Uh, it's like a private group so I could approve anything and get anyone to join and then they could share stuff and it it reached about 65,000 members recently um, and I kind of I just wanted it to share my passion with other people so they could share their passion um, it was really delightful that it got to got to that um, it was similar was Twitter uh, that was just a way of me cataloging and archiving what I've got and just showing people um, daily design and that reached nearly 100,000 unexpected followers as well so um, there's obviously people who share that passion, which is great. I hope everyone on this call has a similar passion so I can talk to everyone afterwards or uh, just reach out there. Um, so I share a lot on social media. I've got two accounts. I've got one which is sharing objects from the archive. Um, as I say, it's, it's almost a cataloging tool for me, which I'll one day need to insure it. So uh, this, is a, this is my inventory list, so to speak. So I share a lot of scans of the covers, but also sometimes things of the inners, um, just like the Idea magazine here. You know, these, um, this nice William Morris piece here that I use for a, for a lecture. Uh, it's amazing some things you can find as well. I mean, this piece here, um, it might be really small on a film screen. Um, it's from a theatre in the 1920s in Japan. It's got a really nice cut illustration. It's almost just like palette cut. Um, bodies on there is, is fantastic um, and then I share a bit on my per, my personal Instagram which is basically the archive and pictures of my toddler in between <laughs> so if you're not bothered about toddlers then uh, you might as well just follow Design Review and, and not my uh, back month count um, there's a nice picture here this is this is this is um, from a while back this I did a project for a was an organisation it was called the Timber Shop, the Timber Project. Um, it was, it was probably about a decade now. And I was using stuff like Jury and Shroff as covers and like this crowd catalogue. And I was trying to find kind of ways that I could kind of denote palettes and, and, and denote pieces of things going together, like IKEA furniture. Uh, and I used a lot of them in the logo design and the, and the brand visuals. So it was nice to just get some historic context, which didn't have the same meaning at all, but it kind of sparked that buzz for me to do something similar. Um, this one here with all the colours on and this really nice Max Huber catalogue. Um, I've got that Max Huber catalogue in the archive, actually. This for an uh, arts and culture organisation. They just wanted to have this freestyle approach to, to using, using colour and overlays. And we ended up, um, I got a load of coloured paper and I cut out every shape that the brand had used out of paper and scanned them in and vectorised them. So every element of the brand was handmade um, and we created like a library of assets that they could use. So okay, I wanted to have that hand-drawn feeling sort of throughout the whole visual identity. Um, so the third part of my presentation, which is slightly shorter than the rest, uh, is about creating. Um, so sort of utilising the archives and creating something new from something that's been from the past. So where possible, um, I usually I kind of use the archive to create mood boards. So I'll get tons of books out. Um, I'll take photos from above for clients. Uh, I'll ring round stuff. Um, 
usually on Photoshop or InDesign, uh, Illustrator, etc. over the photographs. And I'll get them, I've almost created a visual look and feel mood board from real examples um, and real content, rather than showing just like a final project someone else has done and just like, or oh, someone's done something similar, if you want something like this, I'll kind of piece together this mood board, this amalgamation of, of style and colour. Um, this one was for a classic car show um, where I was just looking at how we could lay the type out and how we could use shape. Um, I've got this really nice Odermatt catalogue here. Um, I really wish I'd have gone to that exhibition. That would have been amazing. Um, 100 plus 3 Swiss posters. Um, and that would have been a dream, basically. I don't think I've ever gone home. And I, I surround myself with things I've collected. So this isn't our bad way of putting up shelves in the office. It's a curved wall. It's slightly curved wall, so I, we, there's no way of getting them straight. I've tried, but I don't want to pull it off the wall. It does agitate me. But I fill the shelves with inspiration. So that changes weekly, monthly, and I'll put things on there I've collected or styles that I'm sort of wanting to refer to. So I've got these, there's four of these, shelves just above where I'm sat now and that kind of is my constant inspiration when I'm on my computer I can just look up and think wow yeah that's that's exactly the sort of style I'm going to go for or it might be that's a direction I want to take on a future project and it kind of gives me those that visual stimuli that kind of stays stored in my brain and then when I pick up a pencil or open illustrator I've got a little bit of content behind it in my head um so I I often don't show my work in these presentations, but I thought seeing as I'm talking a lot about using the archive, I'd show some examples on um what I've done um through using stuff from the archive. So I worked on um, numerous years um with with a client who, who became a, a long-term friend. Um I always say to everyone, just try and befriend all your clients. Um not only are you going to pay the bills, but you know, <laughs> we've all get, get along and it's, I, don't know, I end up just befriending everyone I work with and, and telling them everything about my personal life. It's just the way I am, I guess. I'm an oversharer. Um, and these, I kind of took inspiration from sort of Swiss, Swiss um, typographic style and the photography being utilised on Swiss posters. And we created these around the city. Uh, they really stood out because a lot of design for events in the city doesn't kind of have this sort of toned back Swiss approach. It was nice to see these in the public. Um, we recently, uh, as a studio, um, working on a what's on for our city. And I wanted to create a typographic led system, which could accommodate photographs of all sizes. So rather than try and always get really high res photography and you know the press shots and things like that we could utilize little photographs um, from more grassroots events and let them still have an impact and let them be shown and um, i guess where possible it's i want to sort of push up grassroots culture and make sure that that's priority in the work i do as well and i uh, i think this one's from two or three years ago now I managed to use my uh, joy and uh, passion for collage in an interactive exhibition. So we worked a lot with the Peace Museum over the, few, over the last few years, and we had a lot of archive material, and I wanted to bring that together to kind of show what's, what's on show on this digital exhibition. So it was all interactive online, you could go through various areas and see the impact of bombing. Um, and what that had sort of in society and in the world. So we kind of cut up the archive materials and then I scanned some of those in and put those on Photoshop and then brought them brought them together. Um, and all this was animated as well. We had we had some animated versions. And it's just nice to use that, give that historical museum content a new light as well. So providing that digital exhibition, um, we was able to communicate with a with a bigger audience over lockdown. Um, so there's a few quotes there, which are from newspapers, some blood blot in there. Um, and I wanted to, since towards the end now, but I've got lots of time for questions, to just give a slide 
why design history is important. So I picked on it early on, but I wanted to kind of bring that back to, to height, really. Um, so design history, it informs our decisions with a solid foundation. So understanding everything that's been done in the past, we have a foundation on stuff to create for the future. It provides us with great context for understanding both social, political and cultural factors that have and still influence design. It teaches us the impact design has on culture and the role in which design plays or the role in which we play in society as designers, um, having the tool and technique to communicate. And we can engage with the past to understand and justify the styles we use when undertaking a design brief. So, you know, like I mentioned earlier, if someone wanted some classy packaging design for soap or a brand, we can look at Victorian design or we can look at um, sort of decadent design of certain eras and bring that into our design. So we've got a historical meaning and context behind it. And a, a quote that I read, I think it was on the AIGA website, um, it was about knowing your design history, um, which is it's a, a fantastic quote, which is styles cycle in and out of fashion. History helps us decode the present and forecast the future. Um, and that to me is it sums up my entire <laughs> presentation, really. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's it for the presentation. Uh, I can answer any questions. Um, and a massive thank you for everyone who's attended. I have a habit to just kind of quickly go through things and be so passionate. Um, so if anyone wants to kind of ask stuff in more detail, I'll happily um, answer any of that. Um, first, I've just seen another question from Tony about design and typography under threat from AI. So a lot of students have, have asked me this, and I feel as much as AI, you could teach it to design, but it doesn't have any emotion. It could design something that works, but if a client's willing to pay for AI to do the work, then to me, they're not a client worth having. So I'll never think, I never think the industry is under threat. I think if people are passionate and they're great communicators and they can dissect a client's problem, then you know you, you can't beat that with any technology. Thanks, Mark. I was going to say, is anyone would like to ask any questions from for Matt? Shall I? Go on then, Eugenie. <laughs> Um, I just wondered if uh, you ever came across something that's a magazine called Typos. Um, it was a magazine that was published by the Lund College of Printing, which is the old LCC. And it was brought up by a um, typography teacher called Freddie Lambert, who works for Letterset. And I don't know how many I, I, I don't actually know how many issues there were. I was a student there, and but it was about type and as image. And it was absolutely wonderful. And if you come across it, I would I would suggest that you include it in your archive. And um, if you ever get a couple of issues or so, give me a call because I've got a couple as well. <laughs> and I, I might be ready to actually contribute them to your archive. Okay. So, so I managed to get the because uh, there was two two series, wasn't there? It was two series, and I managed to get the full second series um, of the Fred Lambert ones with a really nice co covers, and, and the material for the covers is really nice. But the yeah. first series where Tim Eckersley was involved with, um, yes, I love Tim Eckersley. I've got a big print from my, on my child's wall, which okay. I've an excuse to buy it. I've only got about three from oh, that set. Well. Well, I'm glad you have, but you haven't mentioned it, and I saw it's worth mentioning. Okay. I also, I also managed, um, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, through a seller in Sweden, I managed to get a full set of Typographica new series, which is like one of my holy grails. Um, All right, yes. Um, okay. All right, well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a little question here about... Um, what are the biggest and smallest items in collection? So I guess biggest in terms of volume is probably my idea magazine collection, which is going on over 200 issues now. 
Um, I'm trying to get all the back issues as well, which is the come and go. I, I keep finding them. But in terms of, I guess, in terms of size, the small, the biggest is I've got an, it's, it's here actually. I need to get it framed. Um, it's really nice. Uh, I'm probably going to roll this up the wrong way now. Is this a really, really nice? I can't level up there, roll all that out. But uh, A0 Olympics poster, which is probably my biggest thing in the archive. I guess my smallest is a stamp, <laughs> which I've got quite a lot of. Um, do I have a favourite piece or is it too hard to choose? Oh, that's always a question I really find uh, hard because I guess for me, my favourite piece of design changes based on my interests. So it was my idea magazines for a while. It's um, I've recently got this really nice concrete poetry catalogue with loads of concrete poetry. And so that's probably my current favourite um, piece in the archive. But it varies, really. I've been collecting Carl Oscar Blaze's work, um, posters, uh, catalogues, and magazine covers, because, um, yeah, he's one, of, he's one of my heroes. So for me, the collection I've got there is is one of, one of my favourites. But... Um, it's hard to have one favourite. I could turn around and pick something up and I say, oh, that's my favourite now. <laughs> Anyone else got any questions they'd like to ask Matt? So can you, you know, just one question I have, you know, can you remember when this passion sort of bubbled to the surface and you think, oh, I'd, you know, I'd like to start having my own archive of inspiration, sort of what point in your design career? You started to collect everything. Yeah, it's, it's tough, really. So I got my first job at a small printers um, in the next in, in, in Leeds. Um, and I was prepping artwork for Heidelberg Presses and Risographs and then doing a bit of design. I, I learned a lot from that. Um, and also, when, whenever I meet people, you get some great stories as well. Um, I, I, there's this great um, thing the printer told me, and he says... <laughs> I know this is not related to the question. I'll move back to it. But um, this, this great thing you told me where, because it was such an expensive mistake making, making an error, basically, when he was laying out time, um, the, the job that he used to have, he, if he found a spelling mistake, he'd get a bonus. So he could go to the, so he'd have more money for pub at the end of the week. <laughs> so he used to read upside down. Um, and I love these little stories you get from some sort of meeting, meeting designers. But I guess through that job, um, I spent a lot of time learning about design and I don't, it's probably might be like this for most people but you graduate and you've got this expectation that oh now I know everything I'm ready but I don't think we're ever ready because everything changes we're always learning um, and to me that's good change is good and through kind of yeah since I got my first job in design I, I started collecting and it was it's kind of needed that visual nourishment really and trying to learn when you've got no tutor uh, and thinking, um, you know, I've got more to learn now. I've got to not learn how, to, I've got to learn more than just how to use software. I've got to learn everything about having a job, doing all these things. Um, and that for me, I, was, I need more content. I need to learn. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And uh, I still get that feeling now. I still think, oh, I've designed this thing and, you know, it works, it's, uh, you know, typographically, it works and it serves its purpose, but is it good enough? Is it, it might be good enough in terms of, you know, it, it pays the bills and it looks good, but has it got enough meaning? And I guess that that constant kind of fear of being caught out, this, it, it becomes a, a kind of over, overshield that with a, with a passion for collecting as well. Yeah. We've got another couple of questions in the chat. Sam from Better Letters talking about, um, do, you, do you see any route towards bringing together archives such as yours with those of places like Letterform Archive, People's Graphic Design Archive and numerous other archives? Yeah, I, I was thinking about uploading a lot of my stuff actually to the People's Graphic Design Archive. I've just... Not a time, basically. But I was going to make an account because I um, um, I'm very pedantic in the in the way I do things sometimes. Um, well, a lot of time. <laughs> so 
when I scan something in, I, I've created this WordPress system. Uh, a lot of what I do now is like WordPress development work as well. So um, I, I input the year, uh, the designer, the client the size, and that all then uploads to a database. I'm able to organize stuff by year uh, and filter it down by numerous things, themes and things like that. So it's all basically exists ready to, to put somewhere um, really. But I would one day, I wouldn't. I mean, this this is this is this is a, a dream, and you know, if it never happens, it'll still be the dream to the to the day I die. Is to one day have a space where people can come and kind of use the archive in their research. So um, a lot of this stuff, I mean, I've been looking at, I picked it up fairly cheap, really. But a lot of this stuff, you know, it's really hard to come by. And for me, having a place where people could kind of drop in and. And view it and, and use it in their practice and be inspired would would be my dream. Be, the, you know the design review towers, so so to speak. That that be the dream, and I don't know, be not for profit, and it would uh, just pay me enough to to get by and keep it going. But you know, we I think it's a pipe dream, but but who knows? But we've got we got letter form archive and Saint Brides for that. So you know, I don't want to step on anyone's toes. Well, never. <laughs> well, maybe of England needs it. Maybe the north of England needs it. We don't think there's a lot like it. No. And MJ uh, is interested to know how do you see design making a sort of mean current design making mean of meaningful change today? I think I think a lot it's a lot of people think it's who you work with. But I also think there's a lot about how you work as an agency. Uh, there's a lot to do about you know having a diverse team. You know you can't Personally, I don't think you can um, create for a diverse range of clients uh, and have social impact without a diverse team that understands the different audiences. Um, mm. but yeah, I, I guess, especially with digital work, it's hard to say about social activism. There's a lot you can do with being more green and using better servers and kind of the way you work being a lot more ethical. Um, but I guess social activism, because it's always almost been an emotional response to what's going on. And arguably, now more than ever, we need we need change, um, especially with all the, you know, the Brexit cost of living crisis. And I feel, you know, I mean, I'd be up for it if anyone in, 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 in this uh, group up for doing some sort of, you know, publication that can have a social impact. And, you know, I'd, I'd be passionate in hearing anyone who's got any ideas and, collaborating on, on something what we can kind of get out there and make a mark on society mm, that sounds a great, yeah that, I think that'd be a good good call out for all of us um I'd just like to thank everyone who's attended tonight especially from some from around the world which is great to see and I especially like to thank Matt for an amazing and inspiring talk oh we've got one more question come in um from Tony which is how do I relate and compete with archive archives? Um, <laughs> well, I never, I never see myself as competing because it's kind of like a personal thing to me, and it's, uh, um, it's just such an, an emotional thing to me. You know, whatever's gone on in my life or anything, I've always had this archive like behind me, so I never see it as competing. And I guess the way it relates is quite hard because I don't have a particular focus. Um, but I, yeah, I kind of think it complements them in a way. Um, and I'm always, you know, I'm inspired by what they collect as well. So it kind of gives me a bit of fuel. And hopefully I'll find things that's not documented what they can add to their archives as well. And it can become this kind of joint approach to things. And we've got another one from Liza, who's a design student. Um, do you think that, the style used in things in the archive would succeed in the modern de 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 design world. I am a design student and it seems that everything is sort of thoroughly overly digitized these days and not very nice. And I find it hard to design things that both fit my style and, and feels feel, and fits also in current design. I think that's a really good question for a to consider from um, Eliza so I think we all struggle to be honest I feel like that as well you know now I'm 
as well. Yeah, I think it is hard as designers. You are you do question so many things, and especially when we work in a very digitized world today. So it's nice to see such beautiful uh, printed ep ephemera. So yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, to me, I, I mean, it's quite tough. I mean, a lot of work we do now is sort of websites work for arts and culture. So it's you know you you sometimes provided with a visual direction. Um, which which is quite difficult for me to then use the archive to to inspire something digital, but I guess if you're really passionate and you've got that backbone and you know you read some of the historical sort of great manuals like you know the Muller Brockman's grid systems and the Helmut Schmidt books and Aunt ML Ruder and things like that and having that backbone backbone behind your work, I guess you could still have a over digitalized feel, but you've got you've got a bit of something behind it really. Um, and I think, especially with stuff being over digitalized, it comes it comes in an art style. You know, I can look at and, and um, you know, my, one of my designers who works for me, she's always trying to get me to like gradients. I'm I'm not a fan. <laughs> I don't think I've ever found. I mean, maybe sometimes I like a gradient, but I just I can't get myself to like a gradient. And I, I think it's just because I love stuff just being flat and plain. Um, but you know, there'll always be stuff that goes in and out of trends, but I guess having your own style and being passionate about your work. So if you're really passionate about you know, Swiss Swiss concrete art or you know the typographic layout of concrete poetry, but you because you're passionate about it, you'll be able to communicate it better. So it's an easier sell to people. Um, but sometimes you know we we do have to design to trends based on briefs and stuff like that but where possible just kind of show all this passion in and tell people this is the right way <laughs> i think that's a lovely answer thank you um yeah thank you to everyone who's take who's joined us tonight it's been so re enjoy really enjoyable evening listening to you and look, talk about your archives i think i'm gonna jump up to bradford now and have a good you know have a look around it'd be great and um thank you for all the support that you because you're obviously an ICD board member that you give to ISTD and educators and designers so thank you very much Matt and on behalf of us all and um take care thanks everyone have a lovely evening